Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. This is our third installment on our series in Ukraine. Uh, tonight's is, is very unique, very special, very focused. Um, and I think everyone who's gonna be here is going to learn about a whole other level to the conflict and to the human dimension uh, that's, that, that is often missing in the discussions about a fly, no-fly zone, yes-fly zone, um, and, and everything else that goes along with it. And, and again, our commitment here is to create a space for dialogue, for learning from each other, from creating space for questions and for, for engagement. Um, and I, I really want to thank all the participants here tonight um, that it, it, we have a very, very special group here. Uh, I first want to thank the, the co-sponsors. Uh, this is, this is a, a joint project of many different groups. Um, this is a project of uh, the Rabbi Arthur Schneier Program for International Affairs at Yeshiva University, the Center for Israel Studies at Yeshiva University, the Bernard Revel Graduate School of Jewish Studies at Yeshiva University, um, the, the Fish Center for Genocide and Holocaust Studies, the YUPAC and the Dunner Political Science uh, uh, Program, as well as the YU Democrats and the YU Republicans. Uh, this is a unified front um, engaged and open to, to this, you know, in this, this, pro this project and this, and this, uh, this problem. Um, I want to thank uh, the president, uh, Rabbi Ari, Ari Berman, for understanding, for seeing right away the importance of this topic. Um, why you sent a large group of students to Vienna to help with refugees and to connect with people on the ground. Um, and we, we have a multiple tiered approach to this and, and, and it's wonderful to see the university next week. Um, Professor Jess Olson, our, our moderator for tonight, will be talking um, with a group of psychologists and social workers from the Wurzweiler School and from the Furkoff School of Psychology uh, talking about um, trauma and repair. Um, so there's a lot of, lot of angles here. And um, I, I really wanna thank, again, everyone came together very quickly under very little notice and, and your expertise is, is sorely needed. Um, um, I'll just briefly introduce um, our panelists. Um, Amelia Glazer uh, is here tonight from University, University of California, San Diego, correct? Did I get that right? Okay, sorry. Um, uh, and Val Vinokur from the New School. Uh, we'll be talking about Isaac Bavo. Um, Jacob Weiss, professor of art history here at Yeshiva University. Um, and, um, and we have a special guest tonight that was not on the program, who, who um, we're thrilled, thrilled to have, uh, Tanya Yakolova who is uh, from Ukraine, who is um, going to be talking with us and engaging in this larger dialogue and this larger conversation. Um, in, and I'm thrilled that my colleague and my dear friend, Jess also will be moderating tonight. Um, but uh, last but not least, um, our provost, Selma Botman, has been a, a, a strong supporter of these sorts of outside engagement uh, from the beginning, and it's really just an honor to have her. She's been she's been with us throughout throughout this. So thank you, Selma, and I'll turn it over to you for a more formal introduction. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ronnie. I would like to um, echo the thanks and particularly call out Ronnie and Jess for all the hard work uh, and organization that has taken place in order to run these these panel discussions. So thank you very much to both of you. Uh, I want to thank the uh, participants uh, on the panel tonight. I think this is a very unique group of people who will enlighten us um, with, with their expertise and wisdom. So what do we think about when we think about Odessa? We think about the Pearl of the Black Sea, its supremely rich history. This is an area that has ties stretching back to ancient Greece, the Golden Horn, the Crimean Khanate, the Duchy of Lithuania, and the Ottoman Empire. It owes its name to Catherine the Great um, and um, has become Ukraine's uh, third largest city. 
but it occupies our imagination and it has occupied the talents and imaginations of so many different writers. Um, one of its founding fathers, the Duke de Richelieu, uh, Mark Twain in his novel, Innocence Abroad, Pushkin and Eisenstein's Battleship Potemkin, um, all of these people have, have produced images and, um, and, and depictions of, of Odessa. And of course, you know, the, the, um, the affection with which Shalom, uh, Shlomo, 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 Shlomo um, Aleichem, sorry, I have a terrible cold, um, has, has written about traders and uh, speculators. And so we can read so much about the culture and tradition, the poetry um, of, of Odessa, but, but closer to home, we in New York City um, also think of little Odessa, the area of Brighton Beach, where so many Jewish immigrants have found a home. So, you know, um, and it's there that so many people are alongside everyone else watching with horror at what's going on daily um, in Ukraine. So I think tonight our panelists will reflect um, not only on this tragic moment, but also um, on the storied history and culture of this important city. So thank you very much, all of you, for being here. Thank you, Selma. As Ronnie mentioned, uh, my name is uh, Professor Jess Olson. I am a, a, an associate professor of Jewish history uh, here at Yeshiva University. Um, I'm going to speak just for very short couple of minutes just to provide a little bit of, of background context in addition to the great context that Selma just provided. Um, I have a little bit of a, of a soft spot, a little bit of a closeness to Odessa uh, insofar as it is, it is my, my Dr. Fata or my, my mentor, or my, uh, my teacher for my PhD, uh, Professor Stephen Zipperstein of Stanford University, uh, who was really one of the first uh, uh, late Jewish historians, not late, uh, meaning late, late, but later generation of Jewish historians, excuse me, uh, to, to write a detailed study of the cultural history of Odessa in his, uh, his, first, his book, first book, which was a major contribution uh, to Russian Jewish historiography. He was regarded among, uh, among Russian Jewish historians as really a, a classic uh, within the field. And one of the things that, that is important to sort of bring uh, forward, in addition to the rich history, uh, the multi-layered, multi-ethnic history of Odessa, uh, is its modern history. Now, the city of Odessa itself, that is a city called Odessa, is actually a fairly modern city. Uh, it originated approximately 1795. It was part of an area, uh, as, as Selma mentioned, brought in uh, to Russia under Catherine the Great as part of the Novorossiskaya Gubernia. But its, its modernity and the vision of building from Odessa a, 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 an opening to the, to the larger world, a major center of trade and exchange uh, in the Black Sea, you know, runs very deeply in the dynamics of the city. Uh, P Professor Zipperstein described it in terms of the Jewish uh, occupation, the Jewish uh, uh, livelihoods, the Jewish existence in Odessa as being what we might consider an urban middle-class paradigm. It was in many ways prefiguring modernity in, in other cities with a significant Jewish population in the Russian empire. Why was it unique? Well, it was this newness that made it unique, where in the rest of the Pale of Settlement, and I should mention that Odessa is outside of the Pale of Settlement, which alone made it unique, that there was an older paradigm, an under, the, the, the classic lo, the locus of Jewish history in the Pale of Settlement is the paradigm that we are familiar with, the paradigm of alienation, of isolation, persecution. But how it was done in Odessa was very different. Odessa was a place for Jews of, of newness, of exceptionalism. It was a cosmopolitan city at a time when cosmopolitanism in the Russian context was still developing. It was a pluralistic city. By 1890, it had a population of around 400,000 with an ethnic breakdown that included about 200,000 Russians, 125,000 Jews, 
38,000 Ukrainians, 17,500 Poles, and about 25,000 assorted others of various nationalities, richly complex cultural history. Jews in Odessa were the second largest group. Why was this? Well, as it turned out, Odessa was on a unique trade axis, which included cities outside of the Russian Empire, including Leipzig, Breslau, Brody, right? And this, this connection, this, this, this connection to the outside world was really what sort of shaped the unique cultural identity of, of Jewish Odessa. By the 1890s, 820 out of the 1660 merchants licenses that were issued by the Russian government were held by Jews. They held 15 of the most important banking houses in Odessa, 105 of the major manufacturing firms in Odessa, 560 of the major commercial houses in Odessa, 140 firms in grain export, which was one of the major exports of Odessa, Odessa bringing the richness of the Ukrainian, uh, the fecund Ukrainian countryside that's celebrated in the yellow of the Ukrainian flag brought through the port of Odessa, right? And it was this dynamism, this economic life, this, this, this plurality, right, which created this sort of modernist inclination of Odessa Jews. It was really a new Jewish man in the world of Russia. So this was the identity of Odessa as a modern, acculturated, and, and Russian phenomenon. Uh, Jews tended to identify in Odessa with that sort of identity. While this did sort of come into question towards the end of, of, of the 19th century, leading into the period which we're going to be dealing with, which are the first few decades of the 20th, and then on into further uh, with Amelia's talk, um, inter-ethnic complexity led sometimes to violence, including a pogrom in 1871, which was really probably more conceptualized as a, a sort of um, inter-ethnic violence. Um, this in turn led to the other explosion of Jewish nationalism in Odessa, which was the arrival of Jewish nationalism, the flourishing of, of Jewish literature in Jewish languages, in addition to Russian, of Yiddish and Hebrew. Odessa boasted the, the home of the great lights of modern Jewish national literature, Yiddish literature, diasporic literature. All of this was contained in this jewel of a city on the Black Sea. So with that, I will conclude my remarks and I wanna turn, uh, turn it over to, I have just spaced the order. I believe we were going to start with, with Jacob uh, who will be uh, opening our eyes visually to one of the most uh, uh, remarkable artistic talents to move, arise in Odessa in the Jewish context uh, in the mid 20th century. So with that, I turn it over to my colleague, Jacob Weiss uh, of Yeshiva University. Great, thank you so much, Jess. Um, I, I just wanted to start by um, thanking um, Selma and Ronnie um, and really the, the university for getting behind these programs. I think um, it's an opportunity not only um, you know, for us to get together with, uh, with wonderful colleagues, uh, Amelia and Val and Tanya in this case, but I think um, for all of us, a great opportunity where we're often to some degree stuck in a kind of academic context to take what we do in terms of the research and the ideas that we sort of spend a lot of time talking about and to relate them to what's going on in the world. And as people, uh, whatever our connection um, personally or professionally to what's going on in Ukraine, we're all obviously very, um, uh, concerned. And so uh, an opportunity like this to um, to be able to reflect on that, I think, is a, is a really a, a real gift. Uh, and I, I think it's I think the university should be commended for for uh, organizing this. And I, I appreciate the opportunity to participate. So with that, um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, and um, and my, my role here, I think, really is uh, to provide something uh, both of an introduction to the culture, um, because of what we'll be focusing on, really, the culture of, uh, of Odessa. And then, uh, as you'll see, uh, using a kind of artist, a lesser known artist uh, than the other uh, great writers and lights that we'll be talking about, but someone who I think uh, reflects very profoundly on, on uh, things that are going on. It's, um, it's really quite difficult to imagine Jewish culture without Odessa. The city's outsized role in giving life 
to and breeding some of the most important Jewish political thinkers of the modern era, notably passionate and eloquent adherents of early Zionism, has long been acknowledged. And Jess's remarks about Steve Zipperstein as being one of the most eloquent, eloquent spokesmen, both on that front, but especially in culture, uh, I'll be reflecting on some of these aspects here. It was from Odessa, after all, where the first calls were issued by Moshe Leib Lillendum for the revival of Israel on the land of its ancestors, and by Leon Pinsker for auto-emancipation. And in Odessa, where Achada Am's Bnei Moshe, the Sons of Moses, was founded, and where Vladimir Jabotinsky's revisionist Zionist writings and views were fermented. These were the most recent representatives of a city long populated by Jewish cultural pioneers. Though deeply acculturated, Odessa's Jews, who in the early 1880s constituted more than one third of the city's population, those statistics that you saw, you heard Jess refer to, were nurtured in Yiddish speaking homes, often had good knowledge of Hebrew, and were generally interested in Jewish issues and ideas. And we're just looking a kind of as a demonstration of the culture in which they grew up, uh, an Eruv map uh, from the 1890s uh, of uh, the community centered around the middle here in the Moldvanka neighborhood uh, where many of the Jews lived. By the middle of the 19th century, Odessa began to attract some of the Russian empire's most ambitious Jewish writers who wrote in several different languages. And uh, Odessa was referred to by one journalist, journalist as a kind of uh, as a kind of language salad, mixing everything together. Simcha Pinsker and Peret Smolskin in Hebrew, Joachim Tarnopol in French, and Osip Rabinovich, Manasha Margulies, and Ilya Oshansky in a heavily influenced Russian inflected by their Jewish background. The first Italian translation of Pushkin was published in the 1850s by the Jewish-born Odessan intellectual Mark Waltuch, the innovative educator Maria Sacker, a long time Odessan became in the 1860s the first woman to have her first have her work published in the Russian Jewish press. Yiddish literature flowered in Odessa. The Yiddish literary luminary Mendel Mochersforim lived in Odessa for most of his adult life. Yiddish writer Yisroel Oxenfeld lived in the city for four decades. Under financial pressures in his early 30s, Sholom Aleichem abandoned with his family their bourgeois apartment in Kiev and moved to humbler quarters in Odessa, where he faced a decade of economic hardship, but began a period of incomparable literary richness. One of his stock characters, Menachem Mendel, defined by his inv investment escapades in Odessa, became a foil for the writer's own calamitous penchant for stock market speculation, and the basis for one of our greatest comic Jewish heroes. Yiddish theater was first consolidated in Odessa with Avram Goldfaden, leading, a leading pioneer settling there in 1858. The Yiddish actor Yankel Adler was born in 1870 into an Odessa grain merchant's family. Local cabarets staged Yiddish plays. Odessa's lively bars and public halls influenced the creation and diffusion of klezmer music. Odessa was a singularly musical place with its theater and later its opera house perhaps its most revered cultural institutions. Already in the 1830s and 1840s, Jews attended the theater in large numbers. Famed local violin teachers attracted Jewish students in the early 20th century, launching many successful careers. Cantorial music thrived in this atmosphere and Odessa's cantors, notably Pinchas Minkowski in the years just prior to the revolution, were among the most famous in Russia. It would be an overstatement, of course, to suggest that the creative explosion of Jewish literature, theater, and music in the late 19th and early 20th century was a result of Odessa's character and nurturing spirit. But it's interesting to note that some of the themes that helped give shape to a sophisticated brand of Jewish culture, marked by radical self-creation, dramatic pan-historical vision, bold intercultural appropriation and fierce independence coupled with criticism of authoritarian values were currencies in which Odessa specialized. I'd like to explore themes through the visual language of a Jewish artist from Odessa of far less renowned whose work expresses in microcosm, I think Odessa's vivid impact and enduring character. 
Yefim Ladozhinsky was born to an Odessan fish salter just prior to the outbreak of World War I. After graduating from the St. Petersburg Royal Academy of Fine Arts and from the Odessa Art College, Ladozhinsky designed sets and costumes for theater and film in different cities, including some of Moscow's famed theaters. For much of his early career, he was a state-supported artist. In the early 1960s, the artist moved more steadily to independent painting and began demonstrating an engagement, one might often, one might actually call it more of an obsession, with the writer Isaac Babel and with their shared city of origin, Odessa. The writer and his city, almost interchangeable expressions of his origins and mindset. In the 1960s and 70s, Ladozhinsky created Growing Up in Odessa, a series of large scale tempera on canvas paintings, chronicling life in the city during his childhood, often seen through the lens of Babel stories, images, or characters. And we're looking at one such painting here, many of these coming from a wonderful local collection in Little Odessa from the Kononov family. And I thank the family for sharing these images uh, they were featured prominently in an exhibition that we organized a number of years ago at the YU Museum, uh, for which Jess uh, was actually a, uh, a consultant and Val also helped very much bringing the artist and writer together. Around the same time, he created a series of paintings inspired by Babel's Red Cavalry stories, which chronicle the first war waged by the newly formed Soviet Union against Poland over territory that is now mainly Ukraine. I'll be showing the artist's illustrations to one of these stories, Crossing the Zebruch, which Val will be discussing in greater detail. Vibrant color and dramatic manipulation of perspective veil Ladozhinsky's critical depiction of life under Soviet rule. The artist's engagement with Jewish subjects and his implied critique of the state made his work off limits within the USSR. In 1978, as part of the wave of Jewish-Russian emigration from the Soviet Union, Ladozhinsky moved to Jerusalem. Before he left, he destroyed an estimated 2,000 works to avoid paying punitive export duties. In addition to the hundreds of works he did manage to take out of the country, Ladozhinsky left many works in the USSR. Uh, many of these were later uh, shepherded out uh, by Norton Dodge, among others, and have formed part of uh, the non-conformist Russian art collection at the Zimmerli Art Museum. During his years in Israel, he recreated portions of the Growing Up in Odessa series and executed a new Red Cavalry series, this time in pen and ink. Ladozhinsky had several solo exhibitions in Israel, reaching some level of recognition and success, but he died there in 1982 taking his own life by hanging himself in his own studio. And um, I suspect that um, really not anything to do with his talent. Um, I think perhaps his real focus on Odessa, um, almost to a, um, I wouldn't say exclusive, um, has perhaps challenged the degree to which he's been more accessible um, to other audiences. And I think um, hopefully that will change. The work that we're looking at, I've returned to my homeland, one of a number of foreboding self-portraits, depicts the artist witnessing the unveiling of his own tombstone. You can see the artist here at the right, his tombstone here, with this gesture in a somewhat darkly comic way, uh, obscuring the epitaph with his final dates. Ladozhinsky's Odessa is a new town an artificially created town. Timelessly linking the present with the past, he collapses our sense of traditional historical narrative by placing himself as here, as a man in his 60s into the cityscape of his youth. Ladozhinsky created this self-portrait shortly after emigrating uh, to Israel, depicting himself as an adult in the Odessa of his youth. He sits on the base of a statue of Armand Jean Duplessis Duke of Richelieu, who uh, Salma referred to earlier, the 19th century French aristocrat credited with transforming Odessa into a cosmopolitan city. Ladozhinsky's childhood dog, Belka, who appears frequently in the, in the Growing Up in Odessa series, sleeps at the artist's feet. Behind him are characters from 1920s Odessa, and of course, the iconic 
Odessa steps leading down to the city's port. Vladizhinsky's Odessa is a magical town, adamantly rejecting pedestrian life, a town in which anything was and is possible, where people could recreate themselves, metaphorically reflected in film, a medium that institutionalizes make-believe. This painting depicts a scene from the film Jewish Luck, which was filmed in Odessa, which became a center for film in the 1920s, where it made use of the town's iconic steps and urban landscape. It's likely that, that Ladizhinsky was actually on site in 1925 when the filming took place. The film Jewish Luck follows Shalom Aleichem's character, Menachem Mendel, as he braves Tsarist oppression in pursuit of fortune. Isaac Babel wrote the film's screenplay and a year later edited two volumes of stories by Shalom Aleichem in Russian translation. Edward Tisse was the film's cinematographer. This scene on the Odessa steps inspired Tisse's work on Sergei Eisenstein's Battleship Potemkin, which perhaps most widely spread the image of Odessa as a crucible of the revolution. The film is most famous for a scene featuring the massacre of innocent civilians by Russian Tsarist troops on the Odessa steps. That there was in fact no Tsarist massacre on the Odessa steps does little to diminish the power of that scene. And today the bloodshed on the Odessa steps is often referred to as if it really happened. One of the most potent examples of the Odessa tendency to bridge fiction and reality. Ladizhinsky's Odessa is a frontier town infused with danger at every turn, bordering on lawlessness. The reputation it carried and perhaps even lived up to as living outside the boundaries of normal genteel society made it an ideal setting for criticism of the Soviet regime and authoritarian practices. It's in the context of these darker images of life in Odessa veiled behind the artist's historicizing veneer and through a flattening lush screen of color with rich color contrasts that Ladozhinsky was able to represent the indignities of Odessans oppressed by harsh living conditions. This seemingly charming cityscape records an episode recalled by the artist when he witnessed a, tam a tram driver who like others in the city tended to treat his route as a kind of self aggrandizing sport. Ladozhinsky attached the following gloss to this painting. The rails that the tram ran on were about two and a half feet apart and ran through the whole city. Even for some time after the revolution, certain tram drivers felt it a matter of professional pride to drive a glass filled with water to the brim through their whole route without spilling a drop. And in fact, this features um, a um, bobble uh, play, I believe, being performed uh, here um, on the poster board in front. Other works adopt a more pointed critical lens of the Soviet administration that took over after the revolution. My Street is Freezing depicts the winter of 1921, which brought ferocious storms and sub-zero temperatures to usually temperate Odessa. Shortages in fuel and wood left, left, led Odessans to burn whatever they could to stay warm, including chairs, fences, and trees lining the city's boulevards. And in fact, in one of uh, Ladzinski's other quotes, he said that he really had no interest in the architecture of Odessa. It was really the Odessans that really represented to him the core of the city. In his scarce goods appear in the shop, the artist offers his portrait of the failed economic policies of the state, which took over from the private businesses in the wake of the revolution. A crowd here pushes its way into a state-owned clothing shop upon hearing news that new goods are finally available. Ladzinski's most direct engagement with Babel was through his two series of illustrations for the Red Cavalry. Babel describes his writing and style in militaristic terms, the use of words and punctuation as a means to put forward the truth. And one of Babel's most uh, notorious, famous quotes, he says, no iron spike can pierce a human heart as icily as a period in the right place. These are the two versions that Ladozhinsky created for the opening story, Crossing the Zebruch, the painted version likely executed while the artist was still in the Soviet Union, and the pen and ink version after the artist had relocated to Israel. It's in this second version 
that I think Ladozhinsky hits upon a more Babalesque artistic, artistic style, or at least more powerfully evokes the spirit of the writer's unrelentingly bold, incisive language. And I'd be interested to hear Val uh, on this question, who's uh, created uh, some of the most beautiful translations of uh, Babel um, recently published. So um, I'd be interested to hear um, his, his expression on these, on these works. The book, which depicts the brutal cl clash between Soviet communism and a traditional religious humanism embodied by Polish Jews and Catholics, must have resonated with the artist's own ideals and with his disgust of what he had experienced under Soviet oppression. Might we imagine that here, Ladozhinsky saw in the intense parallel strokes, cross hatchings and stark contrasts of light and shadow, much different than the more lush color landscapes that we see earlier, an artistic stylistic parallel to Babel's use of the period. One can only hope that the Ladizhinsky's independent Odessan lit legacy lives on in spirit and of course, very much in practice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jacob, for that very illuminating illustration of the fine work of Ladizhinsky. I'm gonna turn now to, uh, to our colleague Val Vinokur, who's going to speak in more depth about the work of Babel uh, to which uh, uh, Ladozhensky's work refers. Well. Uh, thank you so much, Jess, um, and, uh, um, and Jacob, and Ronnie, uh, and um, Selma, and Tanya, and Amelia, and uh, uh, to all of the, um, uh, and, uh, to all of the, to all of the participants for joining us. Um, so it, it's, uh, uh, Jacob's uh, remarks really uh, set up what I'm uh, what I'm about to talk about quite uh, you know, quite nicely. Uh, you know, uh, so 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 so. By the way, um, the um, uh, the uh, um, uh, the illustrations for Red Cavalry are actually included in my translation um, uh, in this book, which is the uh, which is the essential fictions. I'll I'll, I'll put a I'll put a link to the book here for anyone. Uh, for anyone who's uh, for anyone who's who's interested, I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Um, and uh, the really poignant thing about uh, about those illustrations is that um, uh, so as um, uh, as Jacob mentioned, um, uh, Ladozhensky was uh, was not was not allowed to take out um, um, a lot of his own paintings because uh, uh, um, things like paintings and uh, uh, doctoral dissertations and books published uh, before the revolution were uh, icons were considered cultural patrimony uh, that uh, uh, that um, uh, that uh, uh, that people weren't allowed to take out of the country. So he was forced to leave those paintings behind. And then when he got to Israel, he was so depressed specifically about that that it was over the course of a few weeks that he uh, that that he uh, made these eighteen drawings for Red Cavalry. Um, and uh, I think the drawings are actually even more interesting than the Red Cavalry paintings that he left behind, and that ultimately uh, were were able to were able to um, were able to leave um, were able to leave the uh, the country. Another thing that Ladozhensky once said is that for him uh, there were there were there were basically there were there were there were two books uh, that were his greatest influences, you know, in, in terms of his art. One was the Hebrew Bible. And the other was the work of Isaac Babel. So for him, these things were equivalent. He even he said that Babel was 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 my Bible, right? Um, so I was very happy to be able to bring uh, um, his art into dialogue with uh, with uh, some of Babel's stories in this edition. So I'm going to talk primarily about uh, two pieces uh, in this collection. Uh, one of them is. Uh, um, Crossing the Zbruch, which is the first story in um, in uh, Red Cavalry, or as I, I as I translate the story, the, the title, the Crossing of the Zbruch, and the other one, uh, the one I'm going to talk about first, is a piece uh, which is it's the first piece uh, in my collection, um, and it's called Odessa, um, and uh, it was uh, it was something that he published in 1916. Uh, when he would have been about, uh, you know, he, I think he was around 21 years old when he wrote it. Um, and um, 21, 22 years old. Uh, and, and, and so he's writing about Odessa. Um, 
but he's but he's happens to be in Petersburg at the time because uh, just like uh, Nikolai uh, Gogol, one of his heroes, or Mikolai Hohol, if uh, you uh, you want to use his Ukrainian name, left uh, his native Ukraine uh, because he wanted to become a great Russian writer. He moved to Petersburg to do so, right? Um, uh, as early Bobble moved, not well, not to Petersburg. He moved to Petrograd, right, as it was then known during uh, the First World War. So. Um, I'm gonna talk a, 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 just a little bit about this piece, uh, um, Odessa, which is uh, a manifesto uh, or, or really a, an anti-manifesto. It's, kind of it's kind of a mockery of, of, a, of, of a manifesto where he's, 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 he's making this case um, as, a, you know, as, a, as, as, a, as a largely unknown writer. I think he, he published you know, just maybe like a couple of stories in, in, uh, in uh, periodicals but at, at this point. Um, uh, making a case uh, for, uh, as he puts it at the end of this piece, that that that, uh, that uh, Russia's literary messiah will come from the south, will come from Odessa, right? Uh, but here's how he begins uh, this piece. Um, Odessa is a nasty town. Everybody knows this. Instead of saying, what's the difference? Over there, it's, what's the differences? And on top of that, they also say this away and that away. But still, it seems to me you could say a lot of good things about this important and most remarkable city in the Russian Empire. Just consider a city where life is simple and easy. Half of the population consists of Jews. And Jews are a people who are sure about a few basic things. They get married so they won't be lonely, make love so they will live forever, save up money to have houses and buy their wives Astrakhan jackets, love their offspring because after all, it's very good and important to love one's children. So you can already see what a, what a what a weird you know uh, you know uh, manifesto like literary manifesto this is you know uh, the the most important the most remarkable city in the Russian Empire is Odessa. It's mostly full of Jews. Like why? It's mostly full of Jews. And then and and, and what's so special about Jews? They like to have children. They like to you know. <laughs> it's like what what is he what is he talking about? What's literary about this? What's what's Russian about this? Right. Um, and, and so here's here's where we where we get into um, uh, the way that that Odessa has been understood, and the way specifically Bobble's Odessa has been understood as something of a um, heterotopia, right? Not a not a utopia, not a dystopia, but a heterotopia, which is uh, which is a term that um, Michel Foucault uses, right? A heterotopia, you know, hetero as an as an other or outside, other than. Um, and Foucault used this term to, um, to talk about uh, this, this property of being in relation. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's a place that's in relation with all the other places, but in such a way as to suspect, neutralize, or invert the set of relations that they happen to designate, mirror, or reflect. So actually, a mirror is a great, is, is a great, um, uh, is a great example of a heterotopia because you, you look at a mirror, and it's like, oh, it, I guess that's I guess that's me. But at the same time, it's obviously not you. You try to touch the mirror, and you realize that it's not you, right? Um, so, um, uh, so, 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 scholars like Tanya Richardson and Rebecca Stanton have, uh, for for you know, for years, been talking about uh, Odessa as a whole as being a heterotopia, right? When Foucault talks about it, he means certain places like museums or libraries or cemeteries. And interestingly. A lot of uh, Lutsky's paintings of Odessa deal with like there's a painting of a cemetery. I mean, there's there's sort of he's interested in the precisely in the heterotopian aspects of this heterotopian city, right? Um, so uh, so so Odessa is 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 a place of differences of over complexity. Uh, it captures the qualities of of of, um, of borderlands more generally, the spaces where um, uh, you know different times and and, and, and places are juxtaposed, right? Um, and it's also a place where, as Rebecca Stanton, this is how she begins her book on, on Isaac Babel and uh, the, the Odessa School, she says, this is a book about stories that come true, right? Um, it's a place where stories come true, right? And, and again, we see this in, in the Odessa paintings of Ladozhensky that, that, uh, that uh, Jacob showed us with the, you know, with, the, with the scene of the Odessa steps and the making of the film, right? Um, it's a place outside of all places, 
where everyone is an outsider. But of course, if you also think about to the, the fact that when, when anyone is self-conscious, right, you're already outside yourself. So in a way to be self-conscious is to be outside yourself, right? So um, uh, just to give you a few more examples from, uh, from, um, uh, from Babel's uh, anti-manifesto, Odessa, right? Uh, so he says, an Odessan is the opposite of someone from Petrograd. So Odessa is the anti-Petersburg, is the anti-Petrograd, anti right? Um, uh, he says that, uh, I would also think that there will come and come soon the prolific life-giving influence of the Russian South of Russian Odessa, which may be Kisei, the only city in Russia where our very own and much needed national Maupassant will be born. So what does Russia need? Russia needs a French writer <laughs> to, or their own version of a French writer to be born there. And Babel is constantly doing this in the story. He's interjecting these little French expressions, Kisei, uh, you know, Comem, uh, and Malgré tout, right? You know, um, all of these little, 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 uh, little, uh, you know, it, it gestures, right? Um, uh, and finally, he so 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 he he has this other moment where where he where very he very deliberately contrasts um, Odessa or the literature of Odessa, uh, you know, by which he means himself. Obviously, uh, you know, he he doesn't he doesn't really mention anyone else. You know, he, he talks about his mentor Gorky as someone who's like the the John the Baptist to to you know to to his to his Jesus, you know, coming from Odessa, right? But but the contrast with Petersburg, you know, he says. He says, uh, uh, with Dostoevsky, you can feel the uneven gray pavement along which Karamazov walks to the tavern, the heavy and mysterious Petersburg fog. Those gray roads and shrouds of fog have stifled people and having stifled them, contort them in amusing and awful ways, giving birth to a jumble and rumble of passions, making people even more frantic amid the usual human bustle. Do you remember the bright and fructifying sun in Gogol, a man who came from Ukraine? If there are such descriptions, they are but a passing phase. But the nose, the overcoat, the portrait diary of a madman are not just a phase. Petersburg defeated Poltava. Akaki Akakievich has modestly but with brutal efficiency overwritten Gritsko, Father Matvey finished off what Taras had begun. So in other words, he's contrasting the Gogol who, uh, of the Ukrainian stories with the Gogol of the arguably more famous Petersburg stories. And he's saying that the Gogol of the Petersburg stories you know, finished off the Gogol of the Ukrainian stories, just as this uh, uh, Father Matvey, who was this kind of slightly loony uh, monk under whose influence Gogol fell and ultimately starved himself to death uh, as a way of a kind of a ascetic uh, moral atonement for his, own, for his own fiction. And then finally, at the end of the piece, um, uh, Babel writes, he says, lately there's been a lot of writing about how people live, love, kill, and elect local village councils in the province of Olenetsk, Vologda, or say Archangelsk. All of it is written in the most authentic dialect, exactly like they speak in Olenetsk and Vologda. People live there, it turns out, and it's cold. And there's a lot of rough stuff, an old story. And pretty soon people will get sick of reading about this old story. Actually, they're already sick of it. And what I think is Russians will be drawn south to the sea and the sun. Will be drawn? No, in fact, that's wrong. They have been drawn already for many centuries. It is in Russia's persistent drive to the steppe even perhaps to the cross of the Holy Sophia, that she will find her way. People feel the blood should be refreshed. It's stifling here. The literary Messiah invade, awaited in vain for so long will arrive from there, from the sunny steppe washed by the sea. So what is that last bit all about? Well, of course, um, this is, he's, you know, he's, he's talking about the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, right? Uh, when uh, Ivan the Terrible called himself the first Tsar, which means Caesar, right? It set up this, this idea of, uh, of Russia, of Moscow as the third Rome, right? The first Rome fell, Byzantium, Constantinople was the second Rome and Moscow as the inheritor of Eastern Orthodoxy from Byzantium is the third Rome. And as such, uh, it was a very popular opinion in Russia through the 19th century uh, to imagine that it was inevitable that, that Constantinople should somehow pass from the, um, uh, the Ottoman Turks uh, uh, somehow into the Russian Empire. This is something that Dostoevsky 
uh, wrote about as, uh, you know, as, as something that's necessary and an inevitability in his uh, diary of a writer. And so for, for Babel to be kind of cheekily sort of subverting this idea saying, oh, you're, you know, you're always talking about the, you know, the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. Well, well, you know, you got to pass through Odessa if you, if you want to, you know, the mantle of Rome, right? Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's really going to happen in Odessa, right? A, a city, a city full of Jews uh, where, uh, you know, where people also speak French, right? Uh, so it, it's, he's, he's sort of, he's sort of tweaking this, this, uh, uh, this, this idea, right? Because throughout what he's really saying is how the, the son of Odessa, right, is going to somehow burn off this oppressive imperial Petersburg fog, right? So I think it becomes very, very interesting to contrast that with the resurgence of um, this ideological Eurasianism that we have, we have uh, witnessed uh, being enacted uh, with uh, uh, Putin's invasion of Ukraine. And there's been, uh, there's been uh, some discussion of this in the press lately, especially uh, Jane Burbank had a piece in the New York, uh, in New York Times. And, um, and, uh, and actually there was another piece uh, that just came out in the LA Times by Jawid Kal uh, Kalim, uh, which, is even, which is even more, um, which is even fuller. Um, uh, basically talking about how um, uh, one of uh, Putin's uh, most important ideological influences is this guy named uh, Lev uh, Gumilyov, who, um, uh, who, uh, who is this sort of some crackpot ethnologist, happened to be the son of uh, probably the most famous Russian poet of the 20th century, Anna Akhmatova, um, who, uh, who, who basically uh, um, took uh, ideas that emerged shortly after the Russian Revolution that, uh, that, uh, um, that Russia was destined to become this kind of super ethnos and unite um, the, uh, the, the various uh, you know, ethnicities of the Eurasian steppe, right? And challenge um, uh, the dominance of, uh, of uh, Western, um, uh, of, uh, um, of Western um, European civilization, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, Lev Gumenyov is a very, very important uh, person for, uh, for um, uh, Putin. He, you know, he, he's, you know, he, he has, he has, he has, you know, he has, uh, he has, you know, he has given reading lists with this guy on, on the list. His, 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 his main current ideologist, this guy named Alexander Dugin, uh, who's a fascist and an anti-Semite, um, also very important for, for, for this guy. Gumenyov himself was a bit of an anti-Semite. He supported the sort of Khazar um, uh, theory of uh, Ashkenazi Jewish origins. So every, you know, lots of lots of ethnicities could belong to the super ethnos, but not Jews, right? Jews uh, for uh, Gumilyov were were parasitic. They were mercantile. They didn't they, they didn't play well with others, right? It's it's a very kind of classic trope that that, that, that we that we see that on the one hand Gumilyov was like was you know was like oh this is a this is a synthetic identity. Uh, of Mongols and uh, and uh, you know and uh, Turkic peoples and Slavs and whatever uh, under the aegis of uh, Eastern Orthodoxy, but uh, you know Jews no not so much right. So um, uh, uh, so it's 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 really really interesting to to uh, to read Babel alongside this historical moment. Uh, you know perhaps unfortunately so right. Uh, so, so, um, so, so, so that's a kind of one bookend of what I want to say about Babel um, uh, is his uh, early uh, manifesto Odessa from 1916, and the other piece is um, crossing this bridge, uh, which of course um, uh, is is uh, is um, about you know uh, the Red Cavalry is a, is, a, is about a war between the Soviet Union and Poland that took place largely or I think entirely in Ukraine and. Um, Crossing this bridge, first story uh, in the collection, and and one of the main problems uh, with this story is that um, uh, it's unclear why it's called crossing this bridge. Uh, in fact, one of the earlier translations of it, it was called crossing into Poland, uh, which really kind of makes no sense because nobody knows where Poland was at this point, right? Um, uh, and uh, and but but the main thing is that. The, the, the town uh, that, uh, um, that's 
depicted in the story, which say uh, Novograd Valinsk, the, the river Zbruch does not flow through it. If, if anything, it's the river Sluch. So why does Babel talk about the river Zbruch? Well, uh, I, I have a rather elaborate note about this in my, um, in my, in my, in my edition, because I kind of did a little bit of a deep dive uh, here. And um, uh, so, um, uh, so I, 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 I suggest that there are two possible reasons for Babel's invocation of um, uh, the wrong river. And I don't think it's from an unlikely phonetic confusion. Yeah, I think it's more likely um, uh, an intentional misdirection. But the Zbruch marked used to mark the boundary between the Austro-Hungarian and the Russian empires between 1815 and 1918. And it was the intended border between Poland and Ukraine after the short-lived Polish-Ukrainian alliance of um, 1920. Uh, so in other words, that also means that it was that it was often understood as the boundary between uh, kind of, you know, Catholic Ukraine, which is to say Greek Catholic Ukraine and East and, and Orthodox Ukraine. So that's one reason. The other reason, and this is really my, you know, very fanciful kind of Nabokovian footnote. Um, the river itself is the namesake of, uh, of this um, a pagan idol that was found on its banks in 1848, the Zbruch idol, which was this phallic four-faced idol, uh, which was thought to represent the god Svetovid, who was the Slavic god of war, fertility, and abundance, right? So what, what, what better figurehead for, for, for this region and for this historical moment, and as it's echoed now, Ukraine as this breadbasket, and Ukraine as this as this as this crossroad of armies, right? Um, uh, so, uh, but at the same time, um, the first um, the you know the, the first story. I don't know. I don't know how much time I, I I have. I mean, the 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 the, the story is um, a page and a half long. Um, I don't know. I don't know if. Let me let me know if I should let me know if I should stop now. If I, 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 in the interest of time, although this is such beautiful material, I, I do want to give enough time for our other two okay. panelists. Uh. Right. So I'll. So then, I'll, what, I, what, I, what I'll say is that um, uh, the the story, if you read the story, and it's a, and it's and it's and it's and it's and it's a page and a half long, right? So Red Cavalry was was essentially about Russian imperialism under the cloak of Bolshevik internationalism riding into Ukraine and Poland. And with, with Babel as a fellow traveler, right? Because he, he, he attached himself as a war propagandist to um, uh, the, uh, the first cavalry army. And in the, but in the very first story, he kind of pulls the rug out from under himself or rather out from under his hero, uh, his, his narrator, because he's lodged with this family that is obviously the victim of a pogrom he pretends kind of not to see it. Uh, he pretends to just be disgusted by it. And only in the middle of the night does he realize that he'd been sleeping next to a corpse. He'd been sleeping next to the butchered father of this pregnant Jewish woman who ends the story um, describing how uh, the Poles killed her father in the yard, right? Um, and then, this is the last line of the story. So, you know, and now I wish to know, said the woman with sudden and terrible power. I wish to know where in the whole world you could find another father like my father. And that's how the first story ends. That's the first story. So how does the narrator go on from there? We don't know, but he does, right? Um, and because there's no moral or political answer to the pregnant woman's question at the end of the story. And I'll stop there, thanks. Well, thank you very much for just really excellent insight into a remarkable writer, a remarkable talent. I want to turn now to my colleague, Amelia Glazer, um, whom I've been privileged to know for quite some time. And I'm very excited to hear her talk on Kersonsky and Isaac Babel. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Um, uh, Dr. Olson and I were graduate students together at Stanford, so it's such a pleasure to, to see you, albeit virtually. Um, so you can't really talk about Edessa without talking about Babel, 
but I'm going to come at Bobby from a somewhat different angle and I'll do my best to get through my comments um, as I might try to talk a little bit fast just so that we can hear all of Tanya's responses to things. Um, uh, there's been a recent turn in Ukraine, as some of you might be aware, against Russian literature, against the canon of Russian literature. In fact, Zelensky, in the interview that was conducted the other day with, uh, with four Russian journalists, uh, felt it necessary to come out and say, I'll fight anyone who says that Russian literature isn't worth reading, right? We shouldn't be canceling Russian literature as a thing. But you have to understand why we at this point have to be reassessing Russian influence and Russians who are supporting Putin. Um, so where does Bobby fit into this? Soviet writer, a writer that started to write before the Soviet Union, but very much was canonized during the Soviet period, despite having been shot by Stalin. Um, well, Bob helps us to talk about how Soviet Odessa, as a multi-ethnic place, presents a model, a Soviet model of internationalism that has to be dismantled in order for Ukraine to move toward a truly post-Soviet civic identity. At least this is what Khersonsky, the writer that I'm going to be presenting you with, uh, claims. And I'll present his argument and then we'll see what you all have to say about that. So I'm going to focus on Boris Khersonsky, who you see here to the right. He's an Odessa-based poet and psychotherapist. He, um, in addition to his native Russian, began to write in Ukrainian around 2014. Uh, during the 2013-2014 Euromaidan, which is known in Ukrainian as the Revolution of Dignity or Revolutio Hidnosti, uh, Khersonsky became very active on social media. He stood out as an Odessa-based writer who voiced solidarity with the Maidan. He certainly wasn't alone, but he was in something of a minority in Odessa at the time. And that shifted a little bit. Kherasonsky um, is as enigmatic a figure as Isaac Babel was. He was born to Soviet Jewish parents in Chernivtsi in 1950. He ended up going to medical school in Odessa where he remained. Uh, he converted to Orthodox Christianity during the perestroika years as a dissident, uh, but he continues to embrace both Jewish and Christian identities, usually depending on which one is being criticized. He tends to be a kind of enfant terrible in this, in this sense. Uh, he posts, he often posts live videos of himself reading his work and sometimes playing the organ at home. And this is something he's done increasingly since the beginning of the pandemic. He continues to uh, post now from Italy where he's on a literary fellowship. He left Odessa a week or so ago, as far as I know, it might've been a couple of weeks ago. Um, and, uh, and along with his political activism and his linguistic shift, Kersonsky has playfully criticized his earlier Odessa influences, including Babu, who was an incredibly important influence for Khersonsky as a writer. So that is to say Khersonsky was boycotting Russian literature long before the war began. Uh, so I'll share with you just a, a piece of a, uh, a poem that he wrote in 2010. Uh, Поэтому тексту будут снимать кино, товарищ Бабель величает товарища Сталина, но Бабеля расстреляют полностью и насовсем. So you have the translation here, but comrade Isaac Babel writes the history of the city O, the great pearl by the Black Sea. They'll make a movie from this text. Comrade Babel exalts comrade Stalin, though they will shoot Babel completely and eternally. So in this poem, Khersonsky is presenting Babel's oeuvre as a tragic remnant of a barbaric regime. This poem comes close to a kind of Odessa blasphemy. By questioning Babel's legacy in Odessa, Khersonsky is calling attention to the Soviet mixture of Russian imperialism and multinationalism that was promoted in the name of communist internationalism. And what Khersonsky has envisioned instead is a European model of pluralism that has definitively rejected all that is Soviet. This is something that's become widespread over the last four weeks, uh, but Khersonsky, as a harsh critic of Russian culture in Odessa has played the role of this kind of provocateur for the last eight years. So uh, Khersonsky reposted this poem uh, in 2011, which was the year that a, uh, a monument to Babel was unveiled in Odessa, and uh, this was a monument 
uh, created actually by Georgi Frangulian, who is is based in Russia. Um, and it was, you know, it was, it was it's, a, it's an interesting monument. It's kind of a nice monument. It's on the corner of Rysilevskaya and Drukovskaya streets. It was sponsored by the Worldwide Club of Odessans, uh, which they, this group raised funding for the statue. Uh, there was a contest that was administered and the winning design was, you know, went to Frangulian, who worked actually in collaboration with an Odessa sculptor, Mikhail Rieva. So Khersonsky's critique of Babel, and in fact, a critique of the Odessa myth in general is part of his broader criticize, criticism of Russia's continued coloniality of power in Ukraine, to use a term from Walter Mignolo. Even 10 years ago, Khersonsky recognized two competing and orthogonal visions of identity in Ukraine, one which is particularly felt in Odessa. And this continues to place Moscow at the center of an internationalist struggle against fascism whereas the other rejects Russia's influence in the region as a nationalist and indeed imperialist impulse in its own right. So Khersonsky in an interview in Shoizdat, the Ukrainian journal Shoizdat uh, told Iakiva, a poet and journalist that um, if you admit that Odessa is more than a city, that it's a country, then the capital, and people have talked right about the, the sort of, um, you know, semiosphere Odessa as, a, as, a, uh, as a, 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 a larger than life landscape. So if you admit that Odessa is a country itself, then the capital, the cultural capital of this country is and will be Moscow. The language of Odessa will be twisted in the image of Yiddish Russian. The Bible will be Babil's Odessa stories. And the official anthem is Two Crooks Broke from the Odessa Slammer, which is a Bagritsky poem. Uh, so here, Khersonsky implies that Odessa, burdened by its place in Russian history, has been unable to move beyond its Soviet role. In that same interview, Khersonsky asserts that Odessans should not only embrace the city's imperial past, but also welcome the future while working to remove the Soviet military monument to a hero city. So I'm not going to go through all these monuments, but I wanted to just give you a little bit of a, an image of the monuments that are in Odessa. Odessa is full of monuments. It has, I think somebody recently, I don't know, tweeted or something that Odessa has more literary monuments than any other city in the world, which I completely believe. Um, it also has a lot of war monuments. So it's it's been a, mem a memory scape of many cultures. And what you see is a little bit of imperial history. Here's the monument to the uh, Bofomilnikov uh, Richelieu statue, which we saw an image of uh, earlier in Jacob's talk. Um, and we, uh, you know, we have statues of Catherine. The Catherine statue went through a, a long transformation where it was taken down and a bust of Marx was put up and then it was put back up again. Um, there are obelisks to, to sailors, there are war memorials, and then there are, you know, monuments not only to, to, uh, uh, literary to, to literary figures, right? To to uh, to Babel and and the like, to Pushkin and so forth, but also to characters, right? Here's a monument to the twelfth chair in the Ilf and Petrov uh, novel, Twelve Chairs. There is a monument to a TV character, Gotsman. Um, there's a really weird and unsettling monument to Rabinovich, the butt of Odessa Jewish jokes, which I read on one website. If you rub its ear or something, you might get good luck in making money. So kind of a, an unsettling uh, tradition in Odessa. Um, so the question that Khersonsky is posing in his writing against the Babel myth, not necessarily against Babel, but against the Babel myth is to what extent does the myth of a Soviet Union that has stood up for internationalism in World War II um, and the sort of official celebration of cultures that was implemented under the guise of Soviet internationalism, to what extent has this actually served and continued to serve as a veiled form of Russian nationalism? So part of what Khersonsky is getting at is the Kremlin rhetoric about Ukraine. There's been an emphasis on World War II and on Soviet internationalism that's been reiterated in official Kremlin rhetoric. Putin in the bizarre manifesto that he posted last summer to the Kremlin website simultaneously reminds Ukraine of various moments of unity in pre-modern history and credits the Soviet Union with inventing the country. 
Um, and here we see his quote, right? In the 1920s and 30s, the Bolsheviks actually promoted the localization policies, really getting into indigenization here. Um, modern Ukraine is entirely the product of the Soviet era. He then reiterated that in his war declaration uh, when he went in a month ago to Ukraine saying, yeah, Lenin invented Ukraine anyway. I'm gonna go take it back, um, more or less, I'm paraphrasing. Dmitry Medvedev followed this with another article in October which was complete with archival footnotes where he suggests that Zelensky being Jewish must be afraid of Ukrainians. So he's bringing, kind of bringing Zelensky's Jewishness into the attack on Ukraine as a quote unquote Nazi state. Um, he, he writes, the current president of this tormented country is a person with certain ethnic roots who spoke Russian all his life. Out of fear of getting another Maidan directed against his personal power, he completely changed his political and moral orientation. So he's saying he's basically scared of the Ukrainians that he's leading. So the insinuation in both of these relatively recent articles without overtly embracing the USSR is that Russia has inherited the legacy of enlightened multi-ethnicity and that it is the defender of, for example, Jews, whereas Ukraine is and always has been vaguely aligned with fascism. So what Khrushchevsky has aligned himself with is the opposite version of, uh, of internationalism, more of a kind of post-Soviet cosmopolitanism. Um, he is entering uh, into this struggle between Russia's claim to a legacy of Soviet-style internationalism and another kind of pluralism. The political scientist Karina Karastelina has, uh, has observed that many supporters of the Euromaidan, quote, believe that Ukraine should build its own civic identity and civic society. And similarly, Volodymyr Kulik has argued that since the Euromaidan protests, the meaning of Ukrainian has begun to change from a national identity to a civic one. So Khrushchevsky, though he also writes in Ukrainian now, is a proud voice of this Russophone contribution to a general civic turn. He was, you know, he's an ethnic Jew, he comes from Odessa, he's Russophone, and yet he identifies as Ukrainian very forcefully. Okay. So for Khrushchevsky, this civic turn involves an explicit and sometimes even an exaggerated rejection of the idea of Soviet internationalism. The more sacred the Soviet narrative, the better. So we find in, in this quote, for example, Kolya will live without, this was posted on May 9th, by the way, a couple of years ago, May 9th is victory day in Europe. Kolya will live without a leg, but with a medal. He'll sing in the basement with any old trash. He'll wander drunk, poor for a neighbor. He'll sing songs of the war of victory. And uh, this rejection of the war narrative, like his rejection of Bob, it exposes his desire to remove Odessa from the Soviet sphere. The bloggers at Timer, which is a Russian language online journal of the Odessa area, called this scandalous. Um, other Odessa writers have also come out against Khrushchevsky, like uh, Taisya Naidinka here. I'm going to just race ahead a little bit so that I can wrap up and move on to Tanya. Here we go. Um, so possibly his harshest critique, uh, Karasovsky's harshest critique of Babel comes in his 2017 book, Adieskaya Intelligentsia, or Odessa Intelligentsia. Um, this is a very biting satire of Odessa literary culture. The book uh, includes a satirical novella, The no Notes of a Madman after Gogol, uh, which features a somewhat misogynist portrayal of the Odessa Intelligentsia who wanders throughout the book. She is a, um, you know, she is a kind of whorish figure. Uh, the, the narrator writes at some point, her mother is Odessa, her father, we're not so sure, but she believes that her father was Isaac Babel, who, you know, uh, admitted to everything before he was, uh, before he was shot. So this singular figure, this bizarre and kind of offensive embodiment of the Odessa mama haunts the waking and dreaming psyche of the first person narrator. She's a literary snob. She's mildly anti-Semitic, but periodically she claims that she is a true internationalist. And the narrator for his part haunts and taunts the Odessa intelligentsia in equal measure. But as the narrator repeats multiple times, I fell madly in love with the Odessa intelligentsia. Um, well, it's 
helps us to understand Khersonsky and what he's doing here with his humor. If we look at a visual artist of Khersonsky's generation, who was actually a very dear friend of Khersonsky, and this is uh, the late Alexander Reutz Bors. In this case, he actually is late. He uh, he died this past summer of COVID. Um, and uh, I was very lucky to, to have gotten to talk to him a couple of times um, over the last couple of years. Um, but he actually uh, enters the, the book at certain points. He's he's this strange figure who, uh, you know, uh, is is he's identified as Krasnoboroder, which is very similar to his actual name, Reut Bord. And the Odessa Intelligentsia asks the narrator at one point, is it true that the artist Krasnoboroder is depicting Shevchenko, the Beatles, Pushkin, and Dostoevsky with, here she's a bit embarrassed, with penises? Not with penises, but with payas, I explained. Oi, that's even worse than the Odessa Intelligentsia turning pale. So there's a lot of, you know, sort of crude humor, crude inside joke uh, humor in this text. Um, well, Roy Bord actually wrote a, uh, a little foreword to the novella, and he has a very uh, poignant reading of Hirosonsky, basically saying that he is engaging in what he calls an anamnesis of Odessa. He's looking at it as the physician that he is and diagnosing it with its, uh, with its ulcers and so forth. And these are a couple of images of Reutbord's own paintings. Here's a statue of Pushkin in his relatively recent Metaphysics of Myth, where Odessa, the great cosmopolitan city, is being invaded by sea creatures. So by way of conclusion, I'll um, just share with you a couple of lines from a, uh, a, a poem that Khersonsky posted on Babel's birthday a few years ago. And, um, you know, he ends this poem by saying, So so revolution is great, robbery is more interesting for a crime lord is just like a king on his throne. So to some extent, Khersonsky's rejection of the Edessa myth is part of the tradition that he's rejecting. Babil, after all, began the essay, Edessa, which Val has, has translated so beautifully with the line, Edessa is a nasty town. So his quarrel, after all, isn't really with the writer that he once loved, but with the tyranny that encroached upon literary freedom by the late 1920s and that later celebrated the writers it had already sacrificed. For Khersonsky, the nostalgic celebration of Soviet Odessa culture, even one that recognizes the sacrifices of Odessa's literary giants, is a threat to a still nascent independent Ukrainian state. I'll go ahead and stop there. Hopefully it didn't go over. Thank you so much, Amelia. Absolutely fascinating, fascinating work. Um, thank you so much for your for your presentation. Uh, I don't want to turn now to our colleague Tanya Yakovleva, uh, who is currently uh, doing us a great favor of of zooming in from Europe. <laughs> I have to I have to to just express my my wonderment and my my absolute gratitude for you uh, to come to this panel tonight. Uh, I guess in early in the morning for you. And uh, I look forward to hearing your comments. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, even working on Odessa for many years, it's great to discover new aspects and new names. Um, so I would like to um, start um, Probably with the first uh, presentation. Thank you, Jacob. Um, Yefim Ladozhensky was a new name for me. And um, um, I have a couple of um, notes, comments um, that we can discuss that uh, just association that came into my mind. Um, one of the first pictures, uh, one of the first paintings that we've seen, the presentation of the presentation was the uh, famous monument of the Duc de Richelieu, one of the first uh, uh, majors of the city, which made also the city so multicultural and uh, multilingual. French was one of the main languages also, and then later, even if the Jewish population was uh, one uh, third 
uh, to the beginning of the 20th century, the Yiddish language was the second uh, popular after the Russian one, which is interesting because even Russian and Jews, they spoke Yiddish. So this uh, monument um, and uh, other paintings um, shows the symbols of the city which um, were used from the beginning of uh, the existence of the city. So this monument of the Duc de Richelieu and I don't know if you have seen in the news recently um, the video um, of the Odessan people under the drums of Bon Jovi trying to cover the monument with the uh, sand. And uh, uh, I found amazing the Ladezhinsky um, steps. I, I, at the beginning I didn't realize that there were steps actually not down, which is in reality, but up like going to the sky, like uh, steps to the sky. Um, yeah, which is uh, fascinating. And again, we had this uh, famous uh, image of the uh, film, uh, the battleship Potemkin, Panzer Kreut, uh, the Braninosets uh, Potemkin of Eisenstein. And it, it's an also interesting fact that in the reality during the revolution of 1905 no uh, actually people were uh, murdered on the steps but for the movie uh, visualization the steps were used and then even the big steps or the Nikolaevsky steps because it was uh, before uh, Nikolaevsky Boulevard which uh, was at the beginning for the steps um, was called just big steps and then after the I think 30 years of the uh, October Revolution of 1905 they uh, decided to rename these steps and this painting of Ladezhinsky uh, which I didn't real, uh, recognize at the beginning with the um, figure of the um, movie Jewish luck, Yevreyske Shastie, based on the Sholem Aleichem story um, Menachem Mendel. And Menachem Mendel's uh, brief, the letters of Menachem Mendel, indeed the first, the very first part uh, out of three is um, based in Odessa. And the movie, of course, is an interpretation with a different story. But the main uh, role is played by uh, a very famous figure also for our discourse, um, so, uh, Solomon Michoels, Shloyme Michoels, who was an actor and then the artistic director of the Jewish uh, um, State Theater of the Gosset and also the chairman of the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee who was then killed. Um, and uh, the Next uh, interesting. Oh, yes, the um, paintings from the series of the Red Cavalry series. They, uh, um, especially with, with this, uh, this picture of the pregnant woman, then we spoke then in, in, in Val's presentation, we've heard about the this scene again, uh, so the pregnant woman um, underneath her father, dead father, it's just the images from the um, modern Mariupol uh, and the kids um, left um, behind their uh, dead parents and uh, yeah, how we see the history repeats 100 years later, just um, crazy. Yeah, I think um, it's, uh, it, it's hard. It's hard to look at those images and not um, not experience uh, a painful sense of uh, resonance and recognition of what's been going on. But the uh, the interesting also part I like that the 
not the architecture was important for Ladozhinsky, but the people, and I would say it's the same, the, the, the main thing for now, because many main cities, uh, um, Kharkiv, Kiev, uh, Mariupol, uh, they don't have architecture right now, but the people who will rebuild it, this is the, the most important part, and I found it also very parallel to the realities that we yeah. have right now. Yeah, I find it, I find it so interesting, you, um, the way you point out uh, his marking uh, Odessa through these uh, monuments and, and looked at mm. in that context, I think he does. I, um, there are a lot of other works that uh, focus also on gangsters, um, Moldvanka region. So he, he did uh, embrace, I think, to some degree, a kind of, um, one might even say a kind of romantic uh, notion of, this, of the city uh, in art. Um, I, I, I chose not to show uh, some of those images um, they're, they're a little bit uh, on the X-rated side. And um, as, I, as I mentioned before, uh, I wasn't as brave as Amelia um, and in, in sort of the, uh, but, um, but there are some wonderful images. And, uh, but I think it's, it's so interesting what you say about his locating himself. And I've always felt that his, um, his compression of space, right? The way that you express that idea of sort of seeing the steps from actually a kind of disjointed, um, disassociative angle. I think mm. the way that he flattens space is a way actually that he's compressing time. It's a kind of expression of his idea of sort of uh, bringing together, and I think to some degree expressing this kind of imagined city, this idea of a, of a city that you know was created anew um, and that he can kind of reimagine himself uh, located there at the site, marking these historical figures, but of course in, in a kind of imagined, um, you know, uh, present day. Yeah, that's true. It, it's it's again we can uh, compare this uh, with Miro and this heterotopia of mm -hmm. uh, Foucault. This comprising the time and the, it's all connected also with the philosophy and the movements that we had one year, uh, one hundred years ago, like also the Bergson theory of time mm -hmm. and uh, the the um, literary conceptions in the. And the, here we have visual conception, even mm -hmm. if it, it it was made later. But I mean, yeah. he he was uh, uh, grown into this uh, sphere of these um, of movements. Mm. Uh, thank you. Uh, then um, I like uh, you. You tell me also how to proceed uh, because I made some. Uh, notes and so if people have some remarks it would be great to um, have well, questions mm -hmm. Tanya I, I think it would be great if you want to just continue in the vein you have been um, and and then each of the presenters can respond uh, to what they uh, feel drawn to respond to <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> yeah I, I, I don't really have maybe real questions but uh, I think it's interesting just to to interchange the thoughts and um, uh, so yeah the the Wals presentation um, where we came closer to the um, bubbles um, uh, I would call it actually sketch this uh, short novel Odessa and uh, I explain also why. It was uh, one of the first uh, pieces I read by Babel, and uh, I didn't expect it at the beginning, that the uh, writer who is uh, famous for being Odessan, which is also a, a mythological, in a way, um, part, because he spent... Uh, mostly of his lifetime outside of Odessa, but he became kind of an Odessa writer. <laughs> uh, and um, there are also theories, of course, that this Mopassan, he is waiting, uh, well, not his, but the, the, the Russian literature is waiting for it himself, uh, the, 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 the Russian Mopassan. 
as so, uh, the bubble. And um, we have this French connection and um, it reminds on the um, physiological sketches that um, started to influence literature in France and in England in the 1840s and also came into Russian Empire with the uh, travelers and actually in Odessa it started to come into life through the uh, one of the Rabinovich so we, we will see on the uh, present uh, on the presentation of Emilia uh, one of the Rabinovich uh, monuments because Odessa had a lot of Rabinovich and that's why it's my theory one of them took the uh, uh, the new names which are mostly common and uh, this Osip Rabinovich who was um, Russian-speaking Jew, he also started to make a, a press in Odessa. So the, the, Russian, the first Russian-Jewish press in Russian Empire was in Odessa and then was also the, the, the Hebrew-speaking uh, press and the Yiddish attachment to this Hebrew um, press. And the, he started to publish in his um, Rasvet um, it was not a newspaper kind of journal. This uh, so, uh, physiological um, sketches about Odessa, and I think Babel has uh, continued in a way like 80, year, 80 years later. Uh, so he made with this uh, just Odessa or with uh, his Odessa um, the the sir, um, the series uh, of Odessa stories. Um, sketch of the characters of the city and it became um, fame uh, uh, mythologized in the literature and famous and uh, as we had uh, him as uh, uh, one of the first of the Russian Soviet uh, literature. We had to forget about the uh, four writers who actually gave him the basic. And it was, for example, uh, Simeon Yushkevich, who wrote, he was of Jewish origin. He wrote about Odessa and in Russian, but he immigrated in the 20s to France. And of course, we couldn't, uh, know about him. Uh, oh, well, in the Soviet Union, you couldn't uh, talk about this writer. So it's interesting how we had kind of no, uh, almost no, um, yeah, literature, Jewish Ukrainian literature before uh, Babel, and then suddenly Babel comes. Uh, I think it's connected uh, to this. Uh, all authors who were in a um, Soviet time just um, not allowed to, to, to talk about, to write about, they were just under uh, censorship. And um, it's, a, it's a really, really interesting uh, connection that you make to Rasviat, uh, um, which of course means, uh, you know, enlightenment. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was a very early um, journal of uh, the, the Russian Jewish Haskalah, right? So it was, you know, and 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 um, uh, in 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 his story, in his story, a uh, uh, Mopassan, Babel actually makes fun of that kind of writing uh, when he's when uh, when when he when he describes it, uh, um, uh, you know, lifeless and loud the way that the way the Jews used to write Russian back in the day, like when Jews first started writing Russian. Like this is what they sounded like, right? I think he's imagining, you know, Osip, Osip Rabinovich. But what's really, really interesting, so, so, so his journal is called Asviat, Enlightenment, and of course, what, what, what the, what the little, what the little physiological sketch, you know, and physiological sketches as part of that kind of enlightenment, uh, you know, project. Physiological sketches as being both cosmopolitan, but also kind of like, um, you know, scientific 
right? In, mm. in some way, right? So here's so here's so here comes Babel, and he's like, oh, enlightenment. I'm not interested in enlightenment. I'm interested in the sun. I'm interested because in, what's the sun? It makes you sweat. It makes everybody sweat, and it blurs everything together. And 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 what I and I write about everything under the sun, right? The sun brings everything together, and it's this mishmash of things. And for Babel, it's you're right. They are like physiological sketches, but they're definitely not about enlightenment. Right. It's, you know, there's, there's a lot of like, you know, obscure stuff going on in his, in his uh, physiological sketches. Like, you know, you, you come away with just very confused ideas, not only of Odessa, but also of Petersburg and of, and of Gorky and of, and of, you know, you know, Hagia Sophia and <laughs> everything, you know? Uh, so it's, it's really, it's really fascinating. I'd completely forgotten about, uh, about, about that connection. And the only other thing that I would point out is that I, you know, it's, it's ironic that, that that Isaac Babel has become like the writer associated with Odessa, because of course, you know, he kind of disappeared between 19, officially, he mm -hmm. disappeared between like 1940 and like 1966 when he was rehabilitated. There were definitely people who, who you know, who still read him and talked about him before 66, but he was only officially rehabilitated during, during the thaw, which is when they started publishing his work in highly censored form um, in, uh, in the, uh, Soviet Union. If I could just throw in one, one other observation, um, on the subject of Rasviet, um, wasn't the only f of the first Jewish newspapers to be published in Odessa, uh, also included was Hamelitz of Alexander Sederbaum, Sederboim, uh, which had a Yiddish insert, Hamagid, so you had literally the birth at exactly the same time, not, I'm sorry, uh, Kol Kolim of Asser. Uh, you oh, literally yes. had this damn. You, you literally had the 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 languages of the Russian Jewish Russian the Pale of Settlement all coming to birth in a modern form of the newspaper happening in Odessa almost at exactly the same time. Yes, yes, that's true. They were like Yiddish, Hebrew, Russian, Yiddish, and Hebrew. Uh, uh, just a short remark back to. Uh, well, that um, he was writing about, not about the Renaissance, but about the sun, and uh, it just uh, um, impossible not to mention that in this time, uh, we know also this whole connection of um, Malevich and his uh, <laughs> direction to paint uh, under the sun and uh, all these cool, interesting um, yeah, and, and, and it's indeed an interesting always um, since the beginning probably of the um, existence of Odessa that we the the, the literature somehow uh, we had the South uh, Palmyra and North Palmyra. So Saint Petersburg was always uh, connected to the North. Uh, uh, paradise in a way uh, built artificially, right? They, they bought the cities, they have indeed a lot in common, but um, in the literature, then it became uh, Norse. And we have here the um, again mythological connection so Norse and uh, death, because we have also in uh, Google stories this. Uh, um, Neva is Leto, the river of the um, mythological underground, and the death is always sun, and so it's a south uh, Palmyra, so it's always lively, and uh, life is here. And, and uh, again, uh, impossible not to mention Jabotinsky, who uh, said that Odessa is different from all the other uh cities in the russian empire and it's in general not not russia for him and then we can come to uh, emilia's presentation where uh interestingly the uh hersonsky but his hersonsky speaks about like odessa is something more than just a city if it would be a country so we have this kind of connection what <laughs> jabotinsky said and interestingly Hersonsky came from Russian into like coming into from one language into another to show to feel also different the, at, 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 
it's kind of difficult now to divide ethnicity with the citizenship in a way. And uh, Jabotinsky also, he started to write in Russian. He was a famous Russian journalist and then he continued to write Russian. And I think Hirsonsky will continue writing Russian, but then Jabotinsky uh, switched to his official language, Hebrew, Yiddish uh, for this um, military um, attempt to, for the rising and uh, building his own state after all these pogroms and uh, um, well he he was an Nostradamus of his time he foreseen a lot of things and uh, yeah it's interesting how uh, Boris Hirsonsky also he, uh, depending on, on the political events and the um, violence again so we have violence uh, connected with uh, kind of revival of uh, culture. We spoke about it last time also with Amelia, how it's connected. And, yeah. Uh, no, that, that's really well, interesting what you're saying. I mean, Odessa, it's true. Odessa has been associated with the birth of all of these nationalisms, right? Mm -hmm. With Zionism, with particular forms of Ukrainian nationalism and so forth. And yet there's this there's tension between Kiev and Moscow. At least that's how Kurosunsky identifies it because he sees a group of people that are sort of recapitulating Russian nationalism under the guise of some kind of cosmopolitan, you know, using cosmopolitanism as a, a Trojan horse for, um, for Russian nationalism. And he's, you know, very much uh, standing up for a, a version of civic nationhood I don't know if you can call it civic nationalism, mm. but civic identity as someone who, who believes that it's about citizenship um, and not about ethnicity. Um, and yet that is a form of right. nationalism, of course, mm. too. Um, so can that also, you know, will could that sweep Odessa or not? I mean, I think maybe mm. now is the test because of course war also engenders that. Right. And that and may so not be a bad thing in this case because it's one nationalism versus another and one mm. seems to be more enlightened at this point. Yeah, but it's interesting also how the uh, process of the um, uh, home country goes through the years. Um, I, I just recently read uh, Boris Chichibabin, who is a Kharkov, who was a Kharkov-based writer, uh, published in some is that like Boris Hirsonsky, and uh, how he was confused after 1991 and writing about. Ukraine is his home, but he still writes in Russian. So how how does it feel? And we have this narrative uh, um, over the years. Uh, that's an interesting connection. I only know a little bit of Chichibabian, but that's an interesting, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, he has, I think, mm -hmm. Moscow. Uh, he, he writes about um, Moscow and uh, Ukraine as his home. Mm -hmm. I think even the... the Two, two pieces are called like Moskovia and uh, and the Ukraine or to the Ukraine something like this and uh, as the uh, Boris Hirsonsky diagnosed in the seizures uh, of his city and not just uh, writing about the glory of the city we had this again with Simeon Yushkevich exactly 100 years ago who was criticized and uh, accused of anti-semitism because he was writing about uh, different um, Jewish characters, positive and negatives, and uh, uh, that's how we also can compare these two writers. Just this, this seems to be a tradition in Odessa. I, you know, I don't. I mm -hmm. I'm I'm wary of the idea of an Odessa tradition because I think that's I think that is, is can be ossified, but um, mm -hmm. it does seem to be that there is there is historically been so much diversity that there's a tradition of um, criticizing the types that emerge in Odessa and then being criticized for criticizing them. <laughs> so it's this kind of, um, you know, it's this this battle of, I, you know, iconoclasm or something. Yeah, which could be maybe um, explain that um, the glorifying of the city 
I don't know, I haven't done the research, it's just uh, uh, out of my mind, made by uh, writers who are coming to this city, right? Like, I don't know, Pushkin, who came for a couple of years, he wrote one of the first about, whoa, Odessa. <laughs> and uh, um, then the, the people who uh, live there, they, they um, a lot of time, of uh, the whole life, they see uh, positive and negative, and it's natural for them also to criticize and show this. And that's actually the 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 myth of Odessa exists out of these both sides. We have the glory and the underground, and it can be um, can be seen one side without the other. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm I'm taking note of the time, um, and 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 not to be um, a person who puts the end to such great discourse. Um, I would like to add that Peretz Molyanskin, who uh, who Selma mentioned, it, or I'm sorry, no, not so, did Selma mention it. Somebody mentioned it. Um, somebody mentioned Peretz Molyanskin. Uh, really captures what you were just saying. Peretz Molyanskin traveled from Belarus, where he was a Lubavitcher, <laughs> ended up in Odessa, where he became Fry, as we like to say, uh, left Odessa to Vienna, where he went into my world, uh, created, in a sense, the, the link between Odessa and the West that gave birth to the origins of, of Jewish nationalism in Central Europe. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of throw that in there to kind of bring it uh, uh, to, 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 to a close. Um, I just want to say a few words to thank everybody uh, for really just stimulating, fascinating program. Um, I wish we could go on all night. Um, we probably have to have more to drink. Uh, but at any rate, I just I, I, I want to thank uh, my colleague Ronnie for uh, being such a, a stalwart uh, proponent of all of these programs. And I really want to thank my colleagues, Amelia, Tanya, Jacob, Val, uh, for, for really coming tonight and, and presenting such a rich, rich view of, 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 of this scene um, that, that I, I think it would be hard pressed to find elsewhere. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Ronnie uh, for the, the closing credits, and uh, we will call it an evening. Uh, this has been really, really something. I just want to say the first time I encountered Isaac Bavo uh, was uh, I was with Val, who's one of my oldest friends in the world. Uh, and we were in a used bookstore in Jerusalem and we found a copy of Borges, we found the copy of Bavel, and uh, we stayed up late reading short stories and uh, it changed my life a little bit. And uh, so this, this art is powerful. This is not simple. This is really, really deep stuff. And I, I thank you all for coming together and bringing all these different perspectives, the art, the history, the context, all these things together. Um, uh, Tanya, thank you for staying up so late. It really means a lot that you can be here with us. Um, I, I loved hearing all the languages that I don't understand um, and that, but I hear them and I can feel them and that's really important. And I hope you can get together in person, face to face and, um, Share some vodka and 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 toast to good things, and um, here in New York, in Europe, in Israel, so wherever we may find ourselves. I should say work. now, not vodka, yeah. horilka. Now just horilka. <laughs> okay, horilka. That's all I'm orders. Horilka from now on. <laughs> I can learn that. That's easy. Um, and and I I I, I want to again. Um, I want to thank Selma. Uh, who, our provost, who's really, who really gets it, who gets that this stuff is important, that these things are, are necessary, that we, we're more than just a place that gives people degrees, that we actually educate. And, um, and, and I, I look forward to really meeting all of you in person. Many of you I can see in person, and I hope we get together. Um, thank you. And thank you to all the co-sponsors. The, the original is in the credits. And um, thank I you wanted for a to wonderful, also start wonderful evening. A wonderful evening. We all benefited from these remarkable scintillating talks. So thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. And, and also the, the recordings of this talk and all of the talks are, can be found very easily at yu.edu slash crisis and hope. And I will put that in the credits 
And, um, and, uh, and, uh, and all right, thank you all. This has been wonderful. What a wonderful night. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Ronnie. Okay, guys. Thanks, Ronnie. Thanks, Jess.